Welcome. You're tuned to the Urban Affairs Program. It's time to get up for Urban Perspectives with your host, Pete Rhodes. Welcome, you're watching Urban Perspectives. I'm your host, Pete Rhodes. This edition of Urban Perspectives is sponsored in part by Comcast, UCARE, and BMANetworks.com. On this episode of Urban Perspectives, we discuss the legacy of African-American contributions as well as the disparities, plus the opportunities for growth in our communities. Thanks for joining us for another impactful show here on Urban Perspectives. Governor Mark Dayton said of my next guest that he will be a strong professional voice in the Dayton administration who is ideally suited for issues concerning human rights, housing, employment, and civil litigation. He is the current commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, he brings 20 years of experience in legal and public policy endeavors. Please welcome Commissioner Kevin Lindsay to Urban Perspectives. How are you doing, Kevin? I'm doing really well. Thank you. I want you. to call you Kevin, but it's Commissioner <laughs> Lindsay. Glad to have you here on the, on the show. Um, we've met a number of times over the years at various events. You tend to be in the community a lot, which I like to see. And so thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Tell us about your journey, uh, Commissioner Lindsay. And is this the position you always thought you have in life? <laughs> Actually, I don't know if I ever really thought I would have the position that I have. Yeah. I always thought that I wanted to do something that would be impactful to mm -hmm. people's lives. And I think that's probably why I became an attorney. I came to the Twin Cities and worked for a very large law firm to start out my career. Yeah. I've been in a small law firm, one by Don Lewis, okay, uh, yeah. Hal and Lewis. I've also uh, worked in-house as an in-house attorney, so I got a chance to see the nuts and bolts inside of a company. Yeah. And then I've also uh, volunteered and been involved in a lot of different things. I've worked for public housing authorities, I've worked for uh, nonprofits concerning uh, issues with individuals with disabilities, uh, youth issues, wide variety of things. Yeah, that's why the governor says you bring a lot to the table in terms of, of, of all these issues. When we, when we talk about that, what has been your goal to address the racial and economic disparities that uh, we see in our in our communities uh, as Commissioner of Human Rights. Sure. So for most people, when they think about the Department of Human Rights, they think about two things primarily. The first is investigating complaints of discrimination. And the department, on average, has about 1,000 complaints of discrimination which are filed. Uh, not all of them are employment-related disputes, mm -hmm. but a vast majority, of about 60 to 65 percent. So for me, coming to the department, I really wanted to uh, up what we were doing on an annual basis on closing investigations. And in this last four years, we've actually doubled the number of complaints that we close out um, over the prior four-year period. Okay. This past year, actually, we did more than 900 complaints that we closed. The governor uh, was very impressed with the very hard work of my staff, and he awarded them a continuous improvement award. Mm, great. The second thing that most people are aware of is that we set goals as it relates to construction. And for most people, they're very aware that the Viking Stadium that's mm -hmm. being constructed here in downtown Minneapolis has a workforce participation goal for minorities of 32%. Prior to the Dayton administration, it was only at 11% wow. on such a project. And a lot of people at the outset were doubtful that we could really achieve 32%. But I really appreciate the very hard work of uh, Chair Michelle Kelm-Helgen at the Sports Facility Authority. Alex Tittle has done a fantastic job on that project. Yes, he has. And we're seeing participation rates for minorities well in excess of 32%. And I should just say briefly, the goal of 11% to 32%, we have now seen participation rate on construction projects in the seven county area. We're looking at data to have more than doubled in less than four years. That's so fantastic. tremendous work for in the area of construction. Yeah. The last thing, just briefly, is in the area of education. We really try to partner with the Commissioner of Education, Minskew, to, to create pipelines of opportunities for students. And we try to work with our connections with state contractors to make those opportunities available. Yeah, well, that's great. And so what is the process for that department in, in working? You talked about uh, Alex Tittle and working with others uh, in and around and outside. What does the, the um, department do in terms of working with other departments to address concerns? Sure. So, for example, on the Viking Stadium, we might work with the Department of Labor as it relates to their apprenticeship program. We'll have sit-down conversations with various union, union leaders, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about their recruiting practices 
and where they're trying to find talent, and then we'll offer up suggestions. We want to partner with them. We view it as a win-win. We want to uh, create opportunities for them to have strong union membership, but we also want to have a diverse workforce that's working for state contractors, mm -hmm. and we see that as a positive partnership. You know, it's often said uh, that uh, it has been said, and I'm not sure if, uh, what the situation is at this point, that the department has been underfunded for, for a number of years. So under your administration, uh, how do you and what have you implemented uh, that creates a platform for change in those areas where there's need in the department, but you've been able to work around it? Well, I've been fortunate on the experience that I've had in litigation, working at various firms to think strategically about how to address employment discrimination suits. Um, as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. it's actually closer to 25, but I'll take 20 years yeah. of experience. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that was something I think I was able to give my staff is a view from both sides of the equation to help them understand and identify the very strong cases earlier on okay. and the cases that really um, need to be addressed in uh, another manner that those could uh, not use as much time within the department. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing for the department though that is really key is that we've really tried to view the education piece of the work in which we do and by that I mean is getting people together to talk about respective issues. For example, like ban the box, when we talk about the impact of criminal history on individuals' ability to get employment, I think people are very surprised about the detrimental impact and how that's used by employers. Okay. Well, I got to say, um, you know, you have done a fantastic job. As I mentioned earlier, I see you a lot in the community, and that allows you to get a pulse of what is needed in these communities, and you continue to move forward and uh, show great promise in what you're doing in the future. So thanks so much for coming here, Commissioner Lindsay, and uh, being a part of this edition of Urban Perspectives. Thank you so much. All I right. really appreciate it. All right, great. Thanks. Thank you. Kevin Lindsay, Commissioner. Weekly here on Urban Perspectives, we present Shining Stars, brought to you by BMANetworks.com, highlighting people, events, and places that contribute to the vibrancy of the urban community. Our Shining Star this week is the Minnesota State Director of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated and a former diversity outreach fellow at the Minnesota Historical Society. His passion for community service and multiple talents make him one of the leaders on the move in the urban community. Let's take a look at our shining star, Sam Mendeli, here on Urban Perspectives. My name is Sam Mendeli, and I am the State Director of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated here in Minnesota. Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated was uh, founded on Friday, January 9th, 1914 at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Um, we've been in Minnesota since the 1970s. The undergrad chapter was chartered in 1985. I came into the organization in 2009. And um, our principles are brotherhood, scholarship, and service. Um, and we're really, really focused on service. That's the culture for service, service for humanity is our motto. Um, and, and we really want to make sure that we're making that impact in our community. This year we will celebrate our 101st year. Um, so last year was our centennial year. We had a big celebration in, in Washington, D.C. in July, and I was able to attend that. And it was a great experience. It was actually kind of life-changing um, to be able to be in a, room, in, in, in a room with very historical members of the organization uh, we got a message from the President of the United States of America, you know, congratulating us on reaching 100 years and all the work we've done over, throughout that time. Um, we've had members of our organization that were very instrumental in things like the Civil Rights Movement. When you look at people like John Lewis, Huey P. Newton, A. Philip Randolph, just to name a few, um, that really shaped the way that this country kind of moved forward when it comes to civil rights. Um, and to be a part of that is something that I, I take great pride and honor in. Um, and that's why I feel like locally here, you know, to try and make an impact in the community on any kind of level and, and being in the leadership positions that I've been at, I feel blessed to be able to, you know, serve in that, in that capacity. I also serve on the National Panhellenic Board here locally, the Twin Cities National Panhellenic Board. That organization consists of some of the members of the Divine Nine, which are the nine historically black fraternities and sororities. Our goal is to try and bring these organizations together on united levels to try and even make a deeper impact in, in the community. My name is Sam Nadelli and you're watching Urban Perspectives. Thank you, Sam. My next guest is a speaker, writer, and specialist on the African American experience. He is a living cyclopedia of life and times of people of color. Professor Mahmoud el Khatik is next on Urban Perspectives.
next guest is an advocate for building humanity through understanding of culture, history, and community. He is a professor emeritus of history at McAllister College in St. Paul. He is an author, a columnist, and a commentator whose voice is globally respected. Please welcome to Urban Perspectives the professor, Mahmoud el -Kate. Well, Good morning, Professor El Kate. And thank you, Pete, for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be on this show. Well, I thank, thank you, you for so inviting much. Me. Uh, yeah. We go back so many years. I'm afraid so. <laughs> I remember you knocking on my door saying, hey, I've got a band that I want you to hear. And yeah. I said, who is this guy? He said, that's Professor Mahmoud El Kate. I said, let's go see who the band is then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and it turned out very well for us. So thanks so much. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get right into it. You have authored numerous books, including mm -hmm. the Hiptionary, mm -hmm. uh, Haiti, the Hidden Truth, the Myth of Race, and Politically Considered, along with uh, an ode to Africa. Mm. How important are these books in clarifying, uh, what you said, Professor, the African-American history? Well, uh, I don't know how much they clarify. They might even cloudy <laughs> the issue. But uh, it's adding, I think, to the narrative. I'm, uh, I certainly don't have any original ideas, but you attempt to make a contribution to what's been going on and the challenges we face as a people as an oppressed people, and I insist on defining black Americans as an oppressed nationality because they are. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have civil rights bills, civil rights act. Uh, we wouldn't have t terrorist organizations uh, doing their duty and maintaining the legacy of slavery mm -hmm. through uh, segregation, Jim Crow, uh, modern uh, words that are used really as subterfuge for the same things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, post-racial, multicultural, and so forth is really a, a, a form of subterfuge for the maintenance, I think, of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And I write out of that context, uh, not that I have anything against white people being white. I'd have a lot against oppression and wrong and That's disrespect for, for yeah. human beings. Yeah. This yeah. is my argument. It's not with how people look is, is, is irrelevant to me. But yeah behavior is the question what you do so what i try to do is add to the narrative that was begun by those people who didn't even write you know people like harriet tubman and and the nameless faceless people who were who lived in captivity uh, for 10 generations and that narrative is 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 alive and well either spoken or written uh, you know, through Frederick Douglass and down to Du Bois and Martin and Malcolm and and uh, uh, Ida B. Wells and all of those uh, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune. It's, I consider myself a part of that narrative. Did uh, you did you always write coming up? No, yeah, a little bit. Uh, I used to started writing about sports. Believe it or not, when I was in college, I had uh, I wrote the sports column. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so I mm -hmm. And I learned about sports through reading uh, black newspapers. Sam Lacey, who I think is the greatest sports writer ever. Uh, Indeed. Uh, Wendell Smith, who wrote for a Chicago paper and who was a roommate of Jackie Robinson. But I was introduced to him when he wrote for the Pittsburgh Curry when I was about nine years old. So uh, that's, you know, that's the writing I tried to do. And then I, you know, the as you get older, you become a little more conscious of the world around you. Yeah, yeah. And you started writing about other things. And in and, and, uh, college, I did write columns. And then I, I met some interesting people who, yeah. who sparked me. You know, I met um, Bill Vick, you know, who, was, who brought uh, Larry Doby into the American uh, League as, as um, his counterpart brought Jackie Robinson into the National League. I see. And he, used a, he was a benefactor of my college, Bill Vick, whose son owns the St. Paul uh, Saints. St. Yeah. Paul Saints, I didn't know. Long. Yeah, that's right. He yeah, was a exactly. lovely man. Yeah, he spent yeah. an hour with me, and he knew Paul Robeson, one of my heroes. One of mine as who well. Who helped found the National Football League. Fritz Pollard was one of the first coaches in the, black, in the, foot, in the football league. He was black, and yeah. people didn't know that quite recently. 
you know, you had a black coach in, in one of the founders, Fritz Pollard from Brown University. Yeah. And the first Rose Bowl and all that kind of stuff. So let me ask you this question, uh -huh. uh, Professor Mahmoud, about the Hipstionary book. In this book, uh, you say that hip <laughs> belongs to a special vocabulary of words. <laughs> Uh, from the African-American culture yeah. uh, to expound on. Uh, what do you mean by that uh, yeah. before we go to well, break? One of the most underrated realities about black presence in America is black people's influence on language. You know, we have uh, in effect created a, a language. Uh, so says the American Linguistic Society who claimed that the black, they call it um, uh, the African American uh, 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 as a is a, a form of English. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a it's a variety of the English language. It's not it's not slang. Mm -hmm. and it's not lazy. And it's not broken. It has its rule governed and so forth. So they they the, the the experts while you and I are sleeping, studying language, claim that. Black English is simply a variety of the English language. It's a language, not a slang, although black people think they speak slang, but they don't. It's a combination of leftover African words like juke, which gives us juke joint, goober, and the, um, you know, the little nuts that we eat, and yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, okra, and gumbo, and jumbo, and there are about a thousand African words left over that we still use. Uh, and then, in addition to creating words out of our environment from slavery, okay. uh, from the country to the city, and Chicago is made a hip city by black speech patterns. That's what I'm saying. Great. Well, yeah. hey, look, let's talk. Uh, we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about that and some of the other uh, yeah, interesting okay. pieces. When we come back, we'll discuss the next generation movement with Professor Mahmoud El Kate here on Urban Perspectives. Stay with us. Thanks for staying. We're back with our special guest, Professor Mahmoud El Kate. You were about to point out the, the influence of the African American dialect on mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. African, the American vocabulary. What was that last yeah, point? Well, it's my contention that you cannot speak American English as opposed to English English in, in mm -hmm. England but, uh, without talking like African Americans. That's an impossibility. Uh, to, to everyday speech of uh, American people, it's partly African-American, and I'll just give you one illustration, which is profound, that the term rock and roll, it's now associated with music exclusively, but this is part of black people's speech pattern, uh, introduced into music by people like Bessie Smith, Ma Rainey, mm -hmm. Elburn Hunter and those, and rock and roll, when Bessie Smith said, I want to rock my daddy with one steady roll, she wasn't talking about music. Music at the I, time. That, that was the way we talked, yeah. and that's a euphemism for sex. I see, J I see. Just as uh, the eagle rock was a dance, there was a euphemism for sex, and so forth has been associated with, with uh, black music, and it was brought to America by a, end quote, I hate to call people like this, a white man named Alan Freed, who mm -hmm. played uh, music only for black youth in Akron and, and uh, Cleveland during the 50s. He packaged it and brought it to Madison Avenue, Hollywood, and so forth, and it was asked, what are you going to call this music? And he said, why not call it rock and roll? Because the term is so repetitive in the music of the four-part harmony groups of the 1950s, you know, Clyde McFally, Fat and the Drifters, The Moon Glows, and so forth. Every other song had rock and roll in yes. it. I'm going to yes. rock my daddy with one steady, steady roll. All she wants to do is rock. All she wants to do is rock, rock and roll all night long. Yeah. Most Americans don't know that. I know so there are black people yeah. who know that, if I know that. Well, now uh, they, they know that. They, now our audience But whites that. have no clue so of what they, it's just music, yeah, you yeah. see. But it well, comes from black speech patterns. Well, speaking yeah. of music, uh, you know, many, pe many people don't know that you're the father of uh, oh, Stokely cool. Williams, the lead singer for Men Condition, considered pro probably now one of the top R&B bands similar to Earth, Wind & Fire. Mm. I want to ask you that, uh, point out that, because I want to know how important do you think music is to the overall struggle and the uh, contributions that we do? Uh, well, music is life with uh, African Americans. We inherit that from Africa. You do everything about music. And, I, you know, I grew up, uh, raised uh, primarily in my formative years by grandmother. So I knew all of those songs from the old tradition, you'll go down Moses. Uh, tell old Pharaoh we are climbing Jacob's ladder, the swing low sweet chariot, and so forth. And also the funny songs, when mm -hmm. the, the folk funny songs, which has disappeared from our music. And I said to say the humorous musicians like Louis Jordan, Chuck Berry was the last one who had 
a, a lot of humor in his music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, it, that's gone. It, it's sad. It's now, sad. Now. That, it's, it's that we're not funny anymore with our with ourselves. Clever. Yeah, 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 clever. Yeah, yeah. But um, we, we are um, a, a, um, a people who we understand why white Americans think the way they do about us because they, they've been trained to do that by mm -hmm. the ide ideology of white supremacy. And they don't understand that themselves. I mean, white people don't know quite what it means to be white in a, in a more fundamental sense because uh, it's, it's a, a new form of reality which begins with modern Europe and, and the discovery of America and all that. There were no white people, there were no Negroes, there were no half-breed Indians. All these are new things that were created by an epoch in history. Well, when, uh, you, when you look at that, Professor Mahmoud, well, how do you give advice to the next generation uh, who uh, looks at uh, probably non-colors, uh, more uh, inclusion overall, how do you mm. give them advice as to being uh, mm. A part of the solution. Yeah, well, we're not a colorblind society. It's fraudulent. Um, you know, I, you see me. I'm black, mm -hmm. and I'm part of reality. I don't deal with foolishness about you don't see me. That's white supremacy. You know, I am a person like you. Uh, all people are fundamentally the same. We have four basic wishes, eleven basic needs. There's more than one way to be human. So the fact that I'm black, you should accept like the rest of nature. You know, this is artificial, this whole thing, and we shouldn't even be discussing people's color and so forth. The major thing about being human is having affinity for other people and respect for other people. That's the basic thing. I may mm -hmm. not even like you, but I respect you. Yes. And that's because I recognize you as a human being, period. That's black people have not been recognized as fully fleshed human beings by this doctrine which refuses to you know, till the day before yesterday, you couldn't use courtesy titles to black people. You wouldn't say Miss, Mrs. and Mr. and so forth. People are trained to do that. Mm -hmm. People, no, no, nobody's born a white supremacist. They're socialized into it by a doctrine, by a political system. And the major uh, reason why this exists is because of power. Racism is a function of power, and racism is white supremacy, yes. Do we have hope for a change in, in, in this behavior among humanity? Absolutely. It's probably because of people like us and all oppressed people. If there's a change, it, it can't, you know, if humanity is to grow, it must come through oppressed people all over the world. Right. And if America is to be a democracy, it's got to come through black Americans right. or there's no democracy. <laughs> Well, Professor Mahmoud El Kate, we really appreciate you coming mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. imparting some of that historical fact to us, and uh, thank you so very well, much. Well, thank we you for having you. me. <laughs> appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching Urban Perspectives. I'd like to thank my sponsors, UCARE, Comcast, and BMA Networks. My guests, Commissioner Kevin Lindsay, our shining star Sam Mandeli, the Professor Mahmoud El Kate, and you, the audience, for getting up with Urban Perspectives. You can visit our website at urbanperspectives.tv for information on our guests and like our Facebook page where you can find behind the scenes photos and more. And remember, there are positive things happening in our cities. See them right here on Urban Perspectives. I'm your host, Pete Rhodes, and I'll see you next week.